Well, Swami Satchidananda, which was the style of, of yoga and yogic lifestyle, um, into the hermetic Western magic, Kabbalah, and now into Kundalini Yoga. But I've learned through another teacher that that's all, those aren't this different paths. This is all part of my process. And I see how it connects, and that getting back to past lives, that past life brought me to to here. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I had only one past life that actually wasn't very interesting, so maybe I'll, <laughs> I'll move on from that. I think I could maybe talk about um, I make theater, and um, I have a company called God Awful National Theater, <laughs> and uh, it started um, actually with um, a group of artists, visual artists, just sitting in a circle trying to uh, telepathically pass our dreams to one another and to feel them. And we didn't, really didn't, nobody was really adept at doing this, but as we practiced it, it was really clear. We were actually feeling each other's dreams and we were enacting them. And the more that we enacted them bodily, um, the more maybe vibrant our connections came. And um, we started trying to explore um, maybe the depths of really bad acting, which is you know kind of a common thing to explore, um, where like you know <laughs> not intentionally, <laughs> mostly not intentionally, but we we try to do it intentionally, like where where like the stiff gesture or the kind of racked mouth um, or the you know the stiff hands or the wandering eyes that open up like deep feeling. And so we started working with this and doing like old plays like Every Man, like the medieval uh, canon. And um, we found that people were actually very horrified and bored, one or the other, uh, when they saw our work. So we decided to move along and uh, <laughs> texts. Uh, uh, and since um, we started this theater, we, I've, I've been doing a lot of the writing, but I work with actors very explicitly on their own um, their own maybe ancestry, depends on the play, their ancestry, their inner life, um, issues that they want to work with, uh, not necessarily specifically trauma, but a lot of the work kind of circles around trauma. Mm. And um, a big part of our process, I'm a, a I guess, professional intuitive, so we, we use a lot of um, intuitive techniques with each other. And for me, um, the way I, I, I practice, I mean, I can tell you specifically about how I practice, but, um, you know, I, I really do feel that we can deeply, deeply connect to one another, that lots of information, whether you're a trained psychic or not, is available uh, to us visually, um, bodily, uh, aurally, A-U-R-A-L, um, and and uh, in, the, in our feeling, you know, in our third chakra where a lot of our persentience is. Uh, and that when we connect past the, um, you know, you look like this, or you sound like that, or like your scarf, or, you know, when we can get deeper inside the body, we make these really profound energetic connections that they don't go away. And so when I'm working with actors, you know, I, I've worked with the same crew, generally speaking, for about, you know, maybe 10 to 15 years, depending on the people. Um, we just try to go deeper and deeper and deeper into the, um, the unseen in, in ourselves. And then I write the text based on that. And um, for me, I think what I, what I, what's the benefit of that, you know, speaking to the subtle activism, um, there's a number of things. I mean, for me, like when we're making a work, we, we really try to make a work that speaks to the times, the zeitgeist, um, the pain at the present. There's so much psychic pain in, um, you know, in the world, obviously, uh, but also we can only kind of deal with our world. So, you know, I'm really specifically thinking about Los Angeles or the United States, um, quote unquote America. Um, there's so much deep, profound pain. And sometimes with, let's say, a progressive audience, there's this tendency to you know, what do you do as a theater person? You have the choir, let's preach to you. You know, like, okay, don't you agree? I don't find that very interesting as, as theater. 
I think it's really interesting to get underneath where we're really not so sure. So the language, is the attempt is to get deep, 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 deep under you and um, kind of loosen the ground underneath. Uh, and the benefit is that we get to feel, which is very difficult in many cultures, uh, wherever, however you grew up, some cultures it's very difficult to feel. Sometimes we numb out, sometimes we evacuate our bodies because we can't feel, you know. Um, and then we get to feel some psychic shift together in a room when we're making the work. Um, and so it's healing for the actors, I think, in a lot of ways. Sometimes healing for the audience, sometimes not so healing. Sometimes we go, like our last piece, because we are God Awful National Theater, at the end of the piece somebody yelled out, Awful! Awful! <laughs> and we thought, oh, that's a plant. But no, really, people hate it. Yeah, so I think for me, I, I, my whole practice is, is in trying to figure out, I haven't really quite done that, like how to shift energies of large groups of people um, in a theatrical manner. Thank you. Thank you, Rokinat. So, um, I'm interested in um, talking a little bit about some of your micro practices, your personal practices that you do for yourself, and how um, you could maybe foresee turning them into um, macro practices so that they can help, um, help humanity or help large groups of people. The whole subject of subtle activism is um, a subject that it interests me because um, you know, energy is really powerful, and if you know how to use it, you can change. Um, you can change the way large groups of people think. You can move the direction of um, the political system. You can do. You can do a lot, and it's been going on for you know time immemorial, where you get large groups of people together, and you um, and you conduct meditations, prayer. Uh, one of the people that I um, that I was reading about, this guy uh, David um, was it David Nickel had written a book called Subtle Activism, and I don't agree with everything he says. I have to say, he says that where you know it, it has to it has to involve large, like enormous groups of people, but that if you pray for your family or you pray for your friends, that is not considered subtle activism, and I you know, I really disagree. No, I really disagree with that. I know you disagree with me on that too. Um, I think anytime you go outside yourself to um, to heal, to help, to change, to shift um, the way things are um, outside yourself, that I think is so active. There are many names that so activism is called. I wrote some of them down, so maybe some of them might ring a bell. I mean, so activism. I think you know what I did. I looked up on the internet. I had this idea, and I looked up on the internet. Paranormal activism, because I thought that was what I was, I may find something. I found everything else but paranormal activism. So maybe I'll take it. Maybe I'll take it. I should have called this paranormal activism. Um, one thing it's called is changing the psychosphere. Uh, spiritual activism. Uh, yoga action on the subtle planes. Collective com contemplative practice. Engaged spirituality, awakened activism, it has many names, but all in all, it's activism which recognizes the active potential of the consciousness spirit, or what might be conceived of as the subtler dimensions in the field of action. So it's like we're hooking into something um, bigger, and um, some, it's like it's there. It's you know like uh, you know radio waves. And we all have access to it. And that's why things get discovered at the same time throughout the world. And as artists, we have that sensitivity. And it's our moral responsibility to share what we get from the other realms um, with others. And that's why we manifest. That's why we make art. That's why we share um, this with people. And I think the, once we realize that we have the potential to not only change one person, but to increase our audience and to, to increase the participation, then our sphere of influence can grow. And we can really change. We don't have to lie in front of a bulldozer to make, you know, to make a point. So I'd like um, to kind of open up the conversation to talk a little bit about how you are, you know, as I said, um, micro practices um, might be expanded 
uh, to uh, affect larger groups of people. And um, we need to see what you have to say about that, and also if you have any questions about that. Pretty much everything that you just said, in a, in a smaller tradition, in a lot of the hermetic traditions, um, which people don't always reveal themselves, and it's hidden, and there's a lot of ritual, there's a lot of misinformation around it, but so much of the spiritual work is work on the astral, on that subtle plane, for the collective good of humanity, and a lot of there's a lot of traditions out there that recognize different energetic patterns that happen, uh, the solstice, the equinox, other sort of high holy days that you'll even see in Christianity and Judaism and, and in our Western culture, but people, ancients, recognize that there's a vibration of that day. There's a space that's being held. So, so many spiritual traditions are taking that energy and working with it, and they're working with it for the greater good of humanity. So it's it's a more elaborate version of, of sort of praying for everybody. But um, that's that's a lot of, of the work is, is that at a, at a group level, there's people that are holding that space and recognizing that you know where it's beyond a religion. That's where it's a spiritual practice. I was always taught that. Spirituality is your own experience, your own spiritual experience, your own connection with something divine. A religion is the celebration of someone else's spiritual experience. And then you just follow that other person. But <clears throat> now is the time that we're all supposed to have our own connections, our own experience. We don't need that, that leader. I mean, we need teachers, but you know the, the information's out there. And it's up to us. So I have my little practice that I do, and I don't, it probably has an effect on the world. I was just listening to a recording of someone talking about, uh, and I think it's probably a basic premise, probably most of us realize, but, you know, when I am shifting myself, I'm shifting, and I, I kind of just focus on myself a lot, not in a selfish way, but I have my spiritual practice that I do that I like, Part of it is, like, I meditate, I do a certain meditation for 31 minutes every single day. I almost do it always in the morning, mostly because I start the day feeling kind of high, and when I'm feeling, like, good, like, it, everything, I navigate everything is, is easy and it's more fluid, and when I'm at that peace, that I just, there's not that conflict, that, you know, I'm not having road rage and all those things that I, will happen for me when I don't do that. Um, but also, I start the day, if I do it right away, I start the day already feeling accomplished. So that kind of sets the tone and I feel more established. But, you know, and I, I have my little routine and my ritual and then I do sit, always end everything with prayers. I'll send out specific prayers and just blessings or ask for that. For that for people and then I expand it and it's like my whole community and just however um, without trying to really manipulate or control but I, a lot of what you said Ron Rivera, is uh, that is so much of the work that was done in hermetic magic as I was taught it so it's just is that space that we hold yeah the other thing too is that when you do a personal practice and you are raising your own vibration and you're expanding your own aura, um, you, every single uh, person's aura that you encounter, you transform it. Detaching auras always have a positive effect on all parties. <laughs> I have an opinion, but you yeah. <laughs> um, That depends on your intention, the intention of the person. Um, Auras do intermingle, and I work with auras a lot. I have people pull them in and tuck them into their grounding cord so they can clean them out. Because we do, we, we expand, and we contract and expand millions of times a day because we're seeking information, bringing it back, seeking information, bringing it back. So, yes, it's, it, it also depends on the intention. I also do aura healings, so I sit you in a chair and I say, pull your aura in, and I, you can feel the energy, you know, um, and I tell you what's releasing. But it's the, it's the intention of the person, you know, what, what is your intention? I mean, what do you want to mess with this person's aura for? Uh, or, you know, 
So yeah, it's it's just an expansion of ourselves, and we can feel it. That's what you know. I, I can feel the people in the room. I can feel every single one of you, and I know what to do with it. And you know, I'm. I, but you have to understand what your focus is about it. You know, is that what your question was? Kind of. Yeah. Uh, I'd like love to add to that, um, and kind of what you were saying, yeah, auras can get, absorb all sorts of weird stuff. You go into a bar, go into an area where people are heavily intoxicated, doing a lot of drugs, a lot of depression, mental illness, especially you, the more sensitive you get, you can feel that stuff, and that stuff definitely attaches to, to everything. I can, I will... I've had experiences where I've even gone, like walked by bars like West Hollywood, that whole sh stretch, a lot of intoxication, a lot of decadence, and I could smell the aura. Like I literally have had experience and it always smells weird and burnt, and it's not like cigarettes or marijuana, it's, it's just this astral scent that totally feels off. But I sometimes go to investigate hauntings and that's one of the things I look for is a lot of times it's a poltergeist energy which is not a specific entity, it's just, it's a lot of negative energies and it's always from some sort of tumultuous, a lot of arguing, emotional releases, um, mental illness, I can sense like a lot of depression, I can, I, I'll go into a room and, and feel that, oh, somebody was here they struggled with this, that, and that, or it'll be, uh, you know, a drug addiction or alcoholism, and and so, um, I used to really protect my aura, and you were talking about, you know, grounding it. Um, now more with my yoga practice, with Kundalini, I'm just taught I just keep mine strong, and I feel. For me personally, I feel less effect, not as affected by other people, but I definitely notice it. But I'm not trying to like mix my aura with every person <laughs> at all. Like that in like hermetic magic. Hermetic means hermetically sealed. Like that is in this impenetrable force. If you make yourself that strong, but you are not running around trying to intermingle your aura with every psyche and person that that runs around. That, I mean, I practice a certain discernment of that. I kind of came up in the spiritualist tradition, like some of these images are attached to that. Um, and uh, I have a, a, a practice, I guess an art practice, called Crystal Crunch with Hariko Tanaka, who um, is a very devout and long-term um, Tibetan Buddhist practitioner. And we teach like very simple, um, connection through the auras, I'm not sorry, not the aura, the chakra system. Um, we teach people how to trust their intuition, essentially. So it's not, I would say it's not very, like it's not advanced psychic training, but it's um, really meant to help people get out of that skeptic zone and that feeling of I can't connect to someone, um, I wouldn't poss couldn't possibly know anything about this person deeply, um, I'm afraid of my intuition. So, and we work with a lot of artists. And to me, it's ironic and sometimes a little sad that artists are very um, afraid, often, not always, of intuition. I think for <clears throat> many of us, we were trained um, like in a very theory-based um, education, where to a certain degree, you know, you might trust language over self. And uh, for a lot of creatives, that can be very, you know, can be a block. So I don't know if anybody here has ever had a situation where they didn't really quite trust their own work. Um, they didn't trust what was coming through to them. And I very much believe that when we're really attuned, artists really do exactly what you said. We bring, we're bringing information, it's not even ours, it's, it's the world. Information through our channel out into a particular form. And in my opinion, there's been a lot of uh, hindrance of that um, that process on the part of our beautiful educational system, which is terrific in many, many, many ways, and teaches critical thinking, which is absolutely mandatory. Uh, but at the same time, that can short circuit our sense of trust, not only in ourselves, but in other people. And I really firmly believe in Crystal Country, we just teach people how to do this, how to tap into each other and reflect 
um, to one another who we are at a very deep level. Um, because I really believe that that, it changes things for people. Uh, and I really believe that, I was working with like a group of French activists, Marxists, <laughs> you know, they weren't the most ready to do the work. <laughs> and th uh, they left feeling like, you know, this is really useful for collaborative and um, communal activities, political activities because we often get locked into like what's here, like my thought, um, my idea versus your idea, my ego versus your ego. Um, I think developing intuition is like developing a muscle. Mm. You know, it's just like going to the gym and, you know, you know, until you realize that you can actually lift that weight and you have trust in, you know, that, yeah, I can do, I can do, I can do 20 of these, I can do 30 of these. It's just like the intuition because at the beginning, what happens is the intellect kind of, and your ego, hijacks the intuitive feeling, right? Yeah, and I mean, I think we all, we all have intuition because we're all beings, you know? So it's not, a, it's, it, I think you're exactly right, but we hone it. So some people practice for years and years and years, and then obviously you all really honed in your skills. Uh, so it's like similar to playing the piano, perhaps. Like, everybody has, can play the piano, if they want to, oh, thank you. Um, but you know, not everybody practices eight hours a day. But nonetheless, even even a little you know soupçon of a taste of your own intuition can really free you, particularly as a creative person, to trust what's coming through you, and not to fear, which is the hardest thing. Once this stuff starts moving through you, I think we all of us, not all of us, many of us get afraid. Like, oh my God, what is this? This isn't anything. How do I justify this? How do I defend this in a court of school? You know, <laughs> uh, and um, and I really think I think we need a balance between uh, the intellect and the intuition in, in art practice in particular. But I think that that can go out into you know larger communities.